switch modes a little bit and we're going to um, talk to uh, Dr. Josh Reicher. He is a third year uh, radiology resident here at Stanford um, who has authored many articles surrounding patient engagement and also in uh, innovation in breast care as well as mammography imaging. And during his residency, he also co-founded a company uh, focusing on uh, secure health communication for patients so that they can be involved in their care. Uh, so we want to hear more about Josh's journey through developing such uh, a program during residency and his perspective on managing patients through not only a physician's uh, uh, perspective, but engaging with patients and helping them to get access to their care. Without further ado, Dr. Riker. And hi, I'm Josh Riker. Uh, as I was introduced, I'm a radiology resident here at Stanford. I'm also a co-founder of a company called Health Companion. Uh, we're a comprehensive consumer health care platform, uh, patient portal, and patient engagement service. I'm going to talk a little bit about Health Companion today, but I actually am going to spend more time talking about some changes in the healthcare industry in terms of sharing data over the last two years and in the upcoming year. And I think that may be useful for everybody uh, in a number of different ways. So what is Health Companion? Uh, you've seen a lot of services that cover similar topics, personal health records, so you can manage your care in a long-term way, prevention and wellness, so leveraging that data to do useful things with it. Health finance management, something I haven't seen talked about as much, but managing HSAs, FSAs, where you are in your deductible. And a social network, which for me, really means the ability to interact with your healthcare team, anything from family to your providers. So I want to set some goals for today's presentation. I'm going to go kind of quickly, uh, but if we set goals, hopefully we can achieve them. So the first one today is actually going to be that I want everyone to become experts in how to share healthcare data uh, in sort of the new modern ecosystem. And the next, of course, is for everyone to sign up for Health Companion and tell all your friends. So, so uh, why? So that's kind of the first question. You know, why did we start Health Companion? You know, what, it, what is this all about? And actually, I'm not going to spend much time on this because if you're at this conference, you already kind of believe in this stuff. This is patient engagement. It's owning your own records. I don't need to go into that too much. Uh, the concept is kind of like a mint for healthcare. Uh, the way that you manage your health, your finances, you should be managing your health records. The way you use Microsoft or Google or Apple to manage your contacts, it should be the same thing with your healthcare data. So the real question for me is why now? So those of you who are kind of into and aware of this industry, which again is probably everyone in this room, uh, you know that Google was in the personal health record business and put some significant time and energy into that and then stepped out a few years ago. Uh, you may know that Microsoft uh, has uh, their product Health Vault, which I don't know how many people have uh, full-time use of Health Vault, but it's, it's fairly limited in its success. So, so why do we think this has changed? So there's two big areas. This is what we're going to talk about. One is infrastructure, and the other is trust. Those are kind of nebulous ideas. I'm going to go into some detail about exactly what that means and why we think it's a new era right now. So the first one is infrastructure. And when I say infrastructure, I mean infrastructure in the healthcare system in the United States. And I'm going to break this down into kind of four areas. So the first is the cloud, which is finally making its way into the storage and management of healthcare data. All the same benefits of cloud-based technology that apply in IT in general apply in healthcare. The next is the law. So uh, many of you probably know a decent amount about Affordable Care Act and its impact in electronic health records. Over $24 billion have been invested in the last two years alone just in encouraging doctors to use electronic health records, not to mention the amount that's gone into developing those and distributing them. Next is standards. So if you want to communicate data in a meaningful way, really applies to communication in general, you have to have standards. You have to have a way that different vendors and different systems can understand. And then the last is, is kind of a new area that I call the exchange, and it's a new technology called an HISP, and I'm going to show you really what that means for those of you who, who haven't heard of it. 
So kind of pictographically, this is how the old days would work. So here we have Allscripts, one of the largest electronic medical record vendors in the country. And then you have Health Companion, another health record uh, vendor. So how did you get information from one to the other and back and forth? And the answer was a lot of time and a lot of money. Uh, very, very difficult process. Um, for those of you who know HL7 interfaces, that's done on a one-to-one -one basis, so it's not just vendor to vendor, it's provider to provider. Uh, it's very time consuming to keep these up, so it's a real effort. So this is where this new infrastructure comes into place. So I'm gonna draw a parallel to email and how email was developed and sort of works in a very simple way. I'm a doctor, not a tech person. This goes, there we go. So if you had Two different email vendors, you had Gmail and you had Outlook, you know, someone using Hotmail and Outlook, and you want to communicate information between those two. Those are different technologies, they're operated by different teams and different companies. How can they communicate? And the answer is you had to have an ISP, an internet service provider, sitting in between them that provided the service of actually transmitting the data across those systems. The other thing that you need is you actually need a standard for how you can communicate that information so that both systems understand it. So now, if Gmail knows this is an HTML-based format, and I can actually read and transmit this data in a meaningful way through this ISP, now you have interoperability. So this is uh, what is currently being implemented nationwide across the healthcare system. Uh, there was something called the Direct Project that was started in 2009 or 2010 that is now really coming into full effect. And it follows this scheme in a totally parallel manner. So again, we have our EMR all scripts here. And then we have uh, you know, another health record vendor like Health Companion. There's actually a new entity called an HISP, which again is made to just completely parallel this ISP above. And that serves to transmit data across these systems. And we have a standard, which is a format of document called a CCDA. This stuff is mandated now that all certified electronic health records follow this and support this technology. And over 80% of hospitals and over 60% of providers are already, they already have this in place or it's being implemented right now. And I would say that the vast majority are in that second category. Uh, technically, it has to be in by January 1, so we'll see what happens in the next three months. The next big area is trust. Uh, trust, really the question is, you know, why do two facilities or, you know, a hospital to a patient, why do we trust that we can send our healthcare data back and forth and that we know what we're receiving is reliable? Uh, it's a very risky endeavor. If you lose health data, you can lose a lot of money. So there's a couple different areas. One is uh, the ACO, which is institutions that were independent are now under a single umbrella, so they automatically have incentives to really trust each other in terms of sharing data. The next is HIEs, which has been another big change nationwide. We have a lot of state-run uh, health information exchange entities. Uh, employers and payers are pushing and getting more involved in this area as well. And then there's actually organizations, and I'll plug one that I'm not related to, but Direct Trust, which is a great organization that I encourage everyone to look into, that really focuses just on this issue of trust. So in the old days, you had hospitals A, B, and C, and they weren't sharing data in any way. And I can tell you, as an intern at the county hospital here two years ago, we were still calling people and sending faxes, and you'd only get part of the data, you couldn't do anything useful with it. Patients were, of course, left completely out of the loop. And that was this whole process we heard about a moment ago where you know, you're still getting paper records. So this is what the new system really looks like, is you've got an ACO now covering hospitals A and B. So they're sharing health data in a meaningful way. Hospital C is still independent, but because of the state-run health information exchange and using these other entities like Direct Trust, they're able to communicate data back and forth and again, there's building incentives to do so. And now all of them are incentivized to get this data into the hands of the patient, again, for all these same sorts of reasons. Now, I thought this was a wonderful segue into what I want to talk about as well here, which is this issue of the seven patient portals. So because of the way these laws were written and the implementation has gone, each hospital, A, B, and C, have all built their own separate patient portal. So if you're a patient that's getting referred to different doctors 
or you move. You know, most people stay in one job for an average of two years now. Uh, you change health insurance plans. Any of these reasons, if you want to get your health data, you have a separate patient portal. It's fragmented data. You can't access it in any reasonable way. And this is where products like ours with Health Companion and, and others like CareSync and many other wonderful products that we've seen at this conference are really going to come into play is to say, you know what, this doesn't make any sense that there's a separate portal for each of these facilities that only has fragmented data. There's one patient that's responsible for all of this data and should have access to everything. Okay, so that was kind of a lot of technical detail. I apologize for it on the one hand. On the other hand, I think it's really important for patients uh, and for other people in general to understand what this impact really means, okay? That whole infrastructure that I talked about, this one here, there's no reason that a patient can't participate at the exact same level as any of these facilities. You have an equal right, and in fact, it's built to support your ability to message and do all sorts of interaction in the same level as these hospitals and clinics. So, so what does that really all mean for me as a patient? You know, where is this going moving forward? Again, this is where our platform, uh, we see some opportunity. So personal health records, prevention and wellness, health finances, and secure communication. This is our home page. This is a snapshot of our personal health record. Uh, you can take a look at that online today if you're interested. What's important about this is no matter where you get these documents from, these CCDA documents, whether they're securely messaged to you or you get them from one of these patient portals for now, however else, you can incorporate all that data automatically. Because they're coming in a standard format, we can take data from any EMR source and incorporate it in a meaningful way so you don't end up with you know, coronary artery disease listed 27 times on your problem list because it's at a few different facilities and you have a reconciled medication list that just has the true summary of your information. In fact, you can turn this around, summarize this information, and instead of next time going into your doctor's appointment having to fill out the little form of your whole history, you can just hand them your information in electronic format or send it to them directly. I think it's actually worthwhile just seeing kind of what these documents look like, these CCDA documents. So they're not the prettiest thing in the world, but the important thing is that they're a standard. And you can see here they've got kind of coded numbers. This is, we're just looking at the medications. It's got the name, the dose, you know, the route, the frequency. And the important thing is because we know how it's going to look, Health Companion, and again, any other electronic health record can take that information and do something useful with it and, with it and put it back into their own system. You can leverage it to do things like secure messaging. So you can email your doctor directly through the system, no matter what system they're using, it'll show up in their inbox. Use things like appointment reminders, refill requests. And then we take all that information and we actually built on top of that a prevention and wellness uh, section, which is based on evidence-based measures, uh, which looks at your risk factors and a few specific questions that we ask on top of that. And we can take that information and tell you actually what you're due for based on those risk factors. So we look at your family history, uh, any you know, congenital diseases, whatever else, and can say, you know what, you're at particular risk for X disease. You need to be screened at an earlier age based on national guidelines. Uh, this piece people often like to take a look at. And the one, the naysayer response that I typically get is, oh, my doctor takes care of that. I probably don't hear that too much at this conference. But it's surprising how you would think there's usually only five or ten things and you think, oh, I'm probably up to date on this. Very, very few people that you meet that actually are up to date on all of their recommended preventive measures. And this is not getting outside of the norm of what your average practice should be. Uh, we've added in beta a component for insurance and finance tracking. Uh, so you can manually input data on HSA, FSA, where you are on your deductible. And we hope down the line to be able to add that in an automated fashion. And I'm not going to spend any time on it right now, but there's clear plugins for employers, payers, and consumer health vendors, devices, things like that to plug into similar systems like this in order to link into the healthcare system. So the way we see the new health data workflow moving forward, regardless of what the backend technology is going to be, is you're going to sign up for your own personal health record. You're going to have a number of vendors to choose from. 
Your doctor is going to have the ability to query information from your account before your visit instead of having to have you fill it out in a manual way. And at the end, they're going to be able to send results back to you. I don't know if this is six months away or five years, but it's, it's definitely on the horizon, uh, and it's a lot closer than it's ever been. So thank you very much for your time, and happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Um, Please. Is physician records for multiple facilities? Endless lists are different, travel lists are different, data is different. Yeah. So, so when data from different portals comes into a common place, who decides what the real problem list is and what's the real medication? It's a great question. I'm not going to pretend that I really know the answer to that. And it's really kind of a system question in general. Uh, we've seen in the last few years, 10 years ago, if you had asked the hospital, I have a problem with this. I'm going to send it to you in electronic format. Would you be willing to incorporate that directly into your health record? The answer would have been no way. No, we're not going to trust the patient, which of course is ridiculous because that's where they're getting the information. They're just getting it because you're telling them. Uh, We've seen a lot of prominent facilities move away from that and start to realize that the reality is if the data is coming from the patient, that's probably just as or often more accurate than if it's coming from, any, from anywhere else. So in particular, the Mayo Clinic uh, recently kind of opened up its security uh, and is starting to accept more information into their system, uh, which was, that was kind of a big moment, I think, in healthcare over the last couple of years. So I think moving forward, we're going to see a lot more flexibility. Now, some systems may decide that there's an intermediary point where they want to review the data and then sort of incorporate it the way we do with medication reconciliation today. So I think that's possible, too. So uh, the system, the groups that we work with today, we primarily work with providers on the provider side. Providers have a lot of both financial and otherwise incentives to start communicating their health data to patients. Patients are more than willing to use a system if you provide it to them. So we show that if you tell a patient in person, you know, sign up for this record and you can see your data, anyway, maybe 5% sign up, something like that. If you send them one email to tell them to do it, you might bump it to 20% or more. And if you send them things like with some of our practices, their radiology report, a couple of days after they have their radiology study, so they have direct access to it, they're far, far more likely to participate. So I think it's really a question of kind of value. Technically, yes. I think it comes back to this question a little bit of kind of what the demand is there. Um, from the provider side, there's lots of reasons. Uh, we incorporate images in general and PDFs and all those sorts of things, but radiology images as files can be up to one gigabyte or more in size. So it's a question of is this something that we're going to be storing in a long-term way and how do you deal with the questions of cost there? Yeah, sure. Where's our little clicker here? So this is our prevention and wellness algorithm. So we can take the records that you've brought into the system, and then, as I mentioned, we ask a few additional risk questions about you know lifetime risk of breast cancer, your family history, those sorts of things. And with that, we can leverage national guidelines that we've put together into an algorithm to determine, OK, you know, what is it that you're actually recommended for based on those risk factors? And there's a lot of funny things people would never think about, which is that people that were born in a certain era in the 60s are actually at risk for hepatitis C and have to have hepatitis C screening. It's not based on a lifestyle or anything else. So there's a lot of things like that that come out of that data that patients may not even be aware of. So if you really want to be healthy, you have to be sort of proactive in finding that. And are we out of time here? One more question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a good, that's the question. Um, 
I think I think for personal health records in general, it's a big it's a big question. And I think that's why one of the reasons we've really seen a lot of limitations and success so far. Uh, frankly, you know, I'm a physician, so our focus has been the physician universe. We see the greatest utility of these things when you can actually get your health records and your health data. That's been our focus so far. I think you know, we, we have designed, and there are many other business models that you could put into play here, including insurance companies, consumer health care vendors, and employers, all of which we have looked at some trials with for the long term. But I think for us right now, the biggest focus is getting the data. And as I mentioned, uh, our providers pay us for the ability just to communicate to patients because they're incentivized financially to do so.